Father in heaven, we come before you today recognizing that you have provided for us a Savior. We come before you recognizing that that Savior is the one who was sufficient for the task that you gave him to save those that you sent him to save. Father, I pray that as we remember your son today, you would allow us to do that according to your word. You would allow us to do it by your spirit. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, this is the point in our service where we're going to take some time to remember Jesus around his table. It's a time for Christians to remember the person of Jesus and what he did on their behalf at the cross. We're going to be taking a small wafer and a bit of juice, and these are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ, which was offered at the cross on behalf of all of those who would believe in him. It's very important during this time that we remember Jesus rightly. So in order to do that, we're going to turn to scripture. We're going to use a passage that helps us uh, see that Jesus' resurrection from the dead affirms that he truly is the Messiah. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 12? We're going to look at verses 38 through 40. And some men are going to be coming down the aisles. And if you don't have a Bible, simply raise your hand and they will get a Bible to you. If you don't own a Bible, please consider this as our gift to you so that you can begin reading God's word for yourself. The setting here starts in verse 22, and Jesus has performed a miracle. He has cast the demon out of a man who is mute and blind. And the demon departed from the man, and the man was able to see, and he was able to speak. And the crowd saw this, and they began to wonder aloud if Jesus was the son of David. They were wondering if, if he was the Messiah that all of Israel was hoping for, that would come and set up his reign on this earth. But the Pharisees were there as well. And they saw this, and they claimed that Jesus cast out this demon by the authority of Satan. Jesus corrected them, and he rebuked them by telling them simply and by telling them plainly that a house divided against itself will not stand. But then Jesus went on to speak against them more, and in verse 34, he starts to expose them for the worthless shepherds that they really are. He describes them as being evil and as being incapable of speaking what is good. And in our passage, the Pharisees are going to take a yet another pass at Jesus. They're going to attempt another pass at discrediting him for who he truly is. So as we read our passage, take note in verse 38 what they demand of Jesus. And then notice Jesus' response in verses 39 and 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and an adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus' teaching up to this point was very hard for the Pharisees to take. So they attack him. They say, we want to see a sign from you. What they are demanding from him is that Jesus himself would provide a tangible sign from the Father in heaven that would affirm the authority of what he was saying. And the root of the problem is not that the Father has not affirmed Christ. He did that at Jesus' baptism. He says in Matthew chapter 3, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the father's authentication, the father's affirmation of Jesus is very, very clear. The real issue is with the Pharisees themselves. Uh, they've heard Jesus teaching. They've heard it clearly. They've heard it plainly. And they've refused to believe it over and over and over again. In verse 39, we see the father's disposition towards that kind of person a person who has become hard to Jesus' teaching, a person who demands a sign to affirm what they are already rejecting. This is the Father's disposition. He says that the one who craves for a sign, the one who is looking for some sort of supernatural affirmation of something that is knowable by normal human means, well, for that person, no sign is going to be given to them. Jesus goes on to explain what will take place. and He describes the story of Jonah. In chapter 1, Jonah is thrown into the sea. And as he is sinking to his death, we read at the very last verse in Jonah chapter 1 that the Lord appointed a great fish that swallowed Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of that great fish for three days and three nights. So the Lord appointed that fish. 
Jonah prays in chapter two. And at the end of chapter two, we read that the Lord commanded the fish and that fish vomited Jonah onto dry land. Jesus' message is very clear here. He's saying, the father has appointed Jesus to enter into death and the father will command Jesus resurrection from that same death. God gave testimony of that to us in a couple of different places in the New Testament. Several, actually, and I'll just mention two for you. The first is in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is the crux of what we want to remember this morning, that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is what uniquely describes him and defines him as the one and only Son of God. And that's important to us this morning. It's very important to us because only the one who is the Son of God could enter into death and could conquer death and could conquer the sin that was the cause of that death and then could be raised from that death in order that believers who believe in him would have newness of life and the ability to walk in that newness of life. So Christian, today you have the ability to walk in that newness of life because Jesus is the Son of God and his resurrection proves that he was the Son of God. So when you think back on your life this week, all of the things that you did that were obedient to the Lord, all the ways in which you lived out the one and others in your home, and in your small group, and in your friendships, and your relationships, all of those things were enabled because Jesus is the Son of God and he was raised from the dead. You can do those things that you could not do prior to conversion because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. So when the elements come to you, hold them and ponder Jesus, his entry into death, his conquering of death, his resurrection from the dead for you so that you could live and walk in newness of life before your God and Father. And then when your heart is prepared, uh, take the elements on your own. If you're here today and you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, we're so glad you're here. We're thankful that you've chosen to worship with us this morning, to be with us. What we want you to know is you need a Savior. You need a Savior who would die for you, who would suffer for you, and who would enter into death and would conquer death and would conquer the sin that was the cause of that death and would give you the ability to walk in newness before the, of life before the God who would, will judge you. And the only Savior who fits that bill, the only Savior who meets those requirements is Christ the Lord, is Jesus Christ. So I will be available after the service at the information table in the front. We will also have people up here at the front afterwards. They will talk with you and pray with you. Um, but when the elements come to you, just take them and pass them to the person next to you and consider the person of Jesus Christ and his role as the true son of God. So men come and serve us. And in a moment, I'll come and close our time in prayer together.